Hey everybody, Adam with Fanic here. Uh, we're going to hit a really good topic today. Um, this is touch skip. Uh, this is for the yellow robots, the non-collaborative guys. Um, this is a multifaceted topic. There's a lot of little nuances as you go through the settings, the, the setup and the execution. So stick with me. This is a really good one, really useful one, low dollar option. I think it's like 600 bucks at the time of this video. Extremely helpful. So stick with me. Let's have some fun. Let's get into today's lesson. All right. So we're going to talk today, like I said, about the touch skip, which is applicable to your industrial yellow robots. Um, there are also a couple robot families that does not play well with, like the Delta series, um, because you can damage the parallel linkage arms um, when trying to touch off on things. But for most of your, your robots, this is uh, an extremely helpful tool. Now, what's nice about it is there's no external hardware needed. No sensors, no force sensors, the little hockey puck, you know, FS-15, FS-100, FS-250. You don't need an actual force sensor for this um, because what we're going to be doing is we're going to be using the built-in current sensors that are in each of the motors. We're, we're going to sense spikes in current when the robot touches stuff. So yes, you'll be touching. So obviously make sure it's a part or a product that you don't mind contact with. But a normal setup might be something like this where I need to find the top of a stack and this operator is completely clueless and did not tell the HMI how many parts there are. And so you can't just assume that there's one or two or three or four boxes. You got to go find where the box is. Now, one thing that I'm a little shorthanded with today, guys, is I'm in a virtual make-believe land of RoboGuide, and I can't actually induce a current spike on these. So I'm going to do what I can to show you how everything works on here, and then you're going to apply it in the real world. Okay, so to jump into this, the first thing you need, and, and, and like I said in, in the beginning, there's a lot of nuances here, so stick with me, write them down. The very first thing is you have to own touch skip. So let's go into our status. Let's go to our version ID, go over to our order FI and look and hey, option J921 is touch skip. You got to own that. Um, so if you don't own it, put it on with a pack code. It's a software only, no hardware. Um, for those of you who have been around a while, starting to get the gray hairs like me here, is it did not always used to be called touch skip. In fact, it used to be called collision skip, as in let's skip over a collision. But that's a big scary word because collision sounds bad. It's got a negative connotation. It makes it sound like you're crashing into something. So we changed it from collision skip to touch skip. I tell you that not just for the fun facts of FANUC, uh, but because that nomenclature is still lingering in the code, and you'll see in just a moment. So you've owned, you now own touch skip. You bought it, you entered your PAT code, you watched my video how to do that. Awesome. Uh, to verify that you have it other than order FI is you'll also be able to go into your menu and under the setup, screen, you'll see touch skip. It now exists. So, uh, and you'll see, and, 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 you'll see in your select, your program select, you're going to see all these weird programs uh, already preloaded into your robot. And you'll see all these programs that are named, no, I'm just kidding. It's actually called collision skip. C-L-S-K-P, collision skip. So we, the nomenclature never got, like the, the program structure naming convention never changed from collision skip to touch skip when we made it sound less scary. You still see collision skip in all of this. And even down here, it's set skip collision, or excuse me, set skip condition for collision, C-O-L. So that's what, what all of these mean. 
Um, the f- next most important thing, other than you bought it, you installed it, it's on, it will not work until you go into your system variables and enable it. Fanic hack that they do this a lot. So um, go to your menu, next, system, variables. And I already browsed there, I cheated. Um, but you're going to scroll down to this line item, the miscellaneous master, right here, misc underscore master underscore T. Press enter to get into that menu. And right here, there's this like, I think it's high speed enable, but the high speed enable by default is false. And if that's false, the touch skip you just bought don't work. So come in here, set it to true, and then cycle power on your robot. I'm not going to waste time on my robot cycling power because it's a fake robot anyhow. But set yours to true, cycle power, come back. Okay, next, we need to, before we can even program the collision skip and, and the conditions and how to use it, we have to set up what we call the schedule. So here's where we go into our menu, setup, go over here to touch skip, and let's open that bad boy up. Oh, I was playing in here. All right, so by default, what you will see, what I'm undoing here is the stuff that you'll see when you first log in. Ha ha, there we go. Okay, when you first come in, you'll see schedule number one, and you'll see a max threshold uh, I've written in amps and a min threshold in amps. Remember, we're doing current detection. And then you have joint, J1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Again, robot, J1, down here at the base. 2, 3, elbow, 4, 5, 6, down to here. And what we're going to be doing is um, setting up a schedule that monitors whatever axes we want. So some of this is a little intuitive. Some of it's learn as you go. I should also note that schedules, you have up to 10 of them. So if I try 11, it'll just yell at me, you know, schedule 99. Nope, you get 10. Um, but this allows you to build different schedules. So like if your robot is doing different things and in one part of your program, you're working in this plane and trying to find a box, but then somewhere later you're trying to escape the singularities and go attack humans outside the fence, uh, you can set a schedule for that. AI is scary. Let's all program against it, regulate it. Um, so let's, uh, let's assume for right now, schedule one is what we're gonna build and we want to plan on this robot touching this box. Well, here's where I just said some of it's intuitive and some of it's learned. If I look at this robot and I see that I'm gonna start here and come down and touch this box, what axis is going to experience the current spike when I'm on my way down? Look at this robot moving up and down what axes or what axis or axes plural are going to be affected? Well, I'm definitely seeing a lot of action up here at J3, right? I see him pivoting. I also see a little bit going on on J2, especially if I have to get farther down, like the boxes are much lower. Look where J2 starts starts doing some work. See that where J3 is not doing as much, but but J2 is doing the work. So if I'm searching in this Z axis, straight up and down, J2 and J3 are going to definitely be the guys that I want to monitor. So that's where I say some of it's intuitive. You got to know what you're doing. But guess what else you can do? On your teach pendant, you can go down to your status screen. And within the status screen, you can go type, which is the F1 key and go to your axis, enter axis. And if you don't see this, that's all right. Scroll through using the previous and next keys. I, I think by default, you'll see the flag bits. 
go to the next screen and click disturb disturbance this is a real-time view showing the current um, disturbance torque in amps that your robot is feeling as well as it has a log of what the maximum was that your robot has felt versus what's actually allowed from the factory. So one thing you can do without damaging your parts or your tooling or your robot is you can actually come over to this robot and apply a force in this plane uh, either by jogging down slowly or just leaving the robot there and pushing up with your hand and, and leaving the robot still. But you can actually see what current uh, this robot is going to feel on what axes. And it'll give you a pretty doggone good ballpark idea of what values you should set for your threshold in that schedule. So do a little experimentation, touch off on the parts, play around, see what kind of disturbance the robot feels, and then go back, menu, setup, touch skip, and you'll now have a pretty good idea of where to set your thresholds. So let's say I'm searching for these boxes. You'll notice Max and min, here's another one of those catching points where people get, get caught all the time. Pay attention, write it down. This column for maximum threshold is a push. The minimum could be perceived as a pull, meaning I've grabbed onto a part and I'm trying to pull up and I'm meeting resistance to where you get negative amperage. So what I might have is something that looks like this. I might say, hey, as I'm moving down, I'm gonna monitor J2 and I'm gonna monitor J3. I'm just gonna make up a couple numbers, totally made up right now because my robot doesn't feel in RoboGuide. But those might be my push force. And if I'm only pushing, meaning I'm going down to a box, my work is done, that's it. But what if I want something in the opposite direction? Well, I might also look something like this or negative 1.78, something that, that shows the robot in the opposite direction, okay? So for your minimum, notice that they can go negative for a pull or you can leave it at zero if we're gonna just go touch something and then the maximum side is, is gonna be the positive. So I'm gonna go ahead and put these in. And again, you'll see positives and negatives on your real robot on that disturbance screen. So if you're moving it left to right, you know, push-pull might not exactly mean push-pull. Left-right could be directional. So don't, don't get too hung up on push and pull. Get more hung up on direction toward or away from the work. Um, but that's why the disturbance screen exists. Now, in true FANUC fashion, it's not enough to put the numbers in. You have to enable it again. Ta-da! So right now, all of these are disabled. I want to say, there's my threshold. Now, choice, enable it. Threshold, F4, choice, enable. Over here, F4, choice, enable. F4, choice, enable enable. Now the robot knows to look at J2 and J3 and nothing else as part of schedule number one. Okay, we've done the setup. We've bought the option. We've checked the system variables. We've monitored the disturbance screen to know what we're looking for. We've set our schedule as such. Now we get into the programming, which has some of its nuances as well. So stick with me. We're gonna go into, I made my program is main. This is a program I made and uh, there's currently nothing at all in it. And what we're gonna do is, um, it, obviously I, I stutter. The, the first thing you should always do in life is have the best four lines of code ever. You know, set your user frame, uh, set your user tool, uh, I just feel so dirty if I don't do this, guys. I'm sorry. It's like a weird 
OCD tick. If I, if I don't have these in here, I'll, I'll freak out. Um, speed. Oh, auto saving. Don't you love when, when you're on a roll and RoboGuide's like, hey guys, I'm going to save your work. Yeah, thanks, RoboGuide. Come on, hot dog. Let's go. All right. Maximum speed, 100%. No one likes a slow robot, except in touch skip. You are limited in speed, and we're going to talk about that soon. Okay. So here's what we're going to do in this program. I'm going to start at just some generic home position. Doesn't matter where, because I'm not going to really use it for the searchy part. We're just starting at home. So linear to home, and I can go there as fast as I want. Okay. So we start at home. Bueno. Okay. Next, what we're going to do is we're going to tell the robot to start expecting collisions or touches. So the first thing we want to do is we want to call what schedule we want to behave, uh, obey or pay attention to. So right now, the only thing we've built is schedule number one. Um, so, you know, if we had other schedules, obviously we'd call those, but let's call schedule number one. Uh, so instructions, call, we're going to call a program and we're going to go all the way down here, set skip collision. This is what we're going to do. So this is the first one we do. Now, when it puts this in, there's two pieces of information I have to give it. The first piece of information I have to give it, and I can do this as indirect addressing if I want. For right now, I'm going to do it as a constant. The first thing I need to do is tell it what schedule. I want to call the set skip collision of schedule one. Okay, that's cool. Uh, if, if we had built schedule two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, one through ten goes there. Then you go choice again, F4 choice, constant, and this will be a one. Any guesses why? It's for group one. The robot is always group one. Um, if you ever, you know, look at the programs, you know, I've got a, a separate video on this, but group robot is always group one. And then you can start adding extended axes which can also have their different skip conditions and everything. But for, for right now, we want to say call schedule one applicable to group one. Okay. Told you there were some nuances in here, guys. Got to really pay, gotta have your wits about you. So here's that. The next thing we do is we're going to call. And we're going to call one of our programs. I hope you read it like that. Call so from now on. Um, it's collision skip, but it just looks like oh. we have to call one. And this is where people get hung up all the time. And I see them make a mistake. And I, I, I see this problem all the time is they call they call collision skip like this. And then they think they're doing the right thing by going like that. Yeah, collision skip group one. Ah doesn't work. You got fired. You already lost the Porsche. Now you lost the Hyundai. And now you got to have a little e-scooter. Um, that is not right. What you need to call is call collision skip G1, which is group one. That's how it's going to work. Tricky stuff. There's landmines all throughout this thing. That's why I'm making this video. So you're going to call collision skip one. With these two lines in place, we are ready to write the actual searching code to get this done. And this is the last part where there's a weird little nuance. I call it the leapfrog effect. So what we need to do is we need to program a place to start searching. Okay, so let's say down from home a little bit, I wanna start searching right here there will never be a box higher than that. This is my start search. So let's say insert a point. Um, linear, we're going to go continuous through this thing. I'm going to call it the start. Now, getting to this point, um, 
excuse me, I've, I've actually made my own mistake. Isn't it great? And I'm not even going to edit this out. I, I, I always make my own mistakes on these guys. Uh, this one is not our start search. Our start search happens right before. So, oh, man, oh, man. I told you there's a leapfrog effect, and it actually gets worse. Let's fix this. Let's fix this. Select, cut, paste, position. All right. So, and touch up. Okay. This is our start position. And we can get there as fast as we want. And this can be fine or continuous. Doesn't really matter. I guess continuous zero doesn't, doesn't really matter. But I'm going to start right here. So I'm going from my home position to my search start. Then I'm telling the robot to start looking for collisions. And then I have my end destination. So start, call your business, and then end. Now, where is the end position? Where's that got to be? The end position should be a point in space where you never expect to get. So something like this, you see I've got my target position is like inside the lowest box. Well, if I start searching here and I don't find box three and I don't find box two and I don't find box one, I'll know by this point in space that I did not find anything. So this is my end destination. So let's go here and I'm going to teach that as my end destination. Teach that as end. And while you're searching, um, I actually can't remember. I think it's 250. It's certainly not more than 500, but I, I literally can't remember. So if someone's going to have to test it, figure it out, drop it in the comments, and I'll pin you at the top because I forgot and I don't have a real robot in front of me. But we're going to go 250, and this is your search speed. So we go from home to a start, call the, the, the collision, and then this is the position you hope to never hit because hopefully by then you'll have found something. Well, that means we have to tell the robot to expect that, hey, we're, we're not actually going to go to this point. So we say choice, and we have the skip label instruction. You'll see there's a bunch of different instructions in here, but skip label. Okay. So the first thing I'm going to do is let me just, I'm just going to arbitrarily make a label here. I'll just call this one label eight. Um, and then I'm going to make another one right below it. I'm going to, I'm going to pre-build some stuff. Bear with me. I'm going to make another one called label nine. Now let's add in some, some code. So, I'm heading to a point I should never get. If I hit something, meaning the skip happened, it's looking for a skip, the skip happened, I am going to go to wherever label 8 is. So what this is saying is, I expect to never reach the end, but en route from start to end, somewhere in the middle, if the skip occurs, I need to go to label 8. So let's make that. Let me scroll down here. Let's make a label eight. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to name it. I'm going to name it uh, touch occurred. Or you could name it part found or something. And touch occurred, this is probably where you would have your stuff like the next thing you might do is, okay, I found my part. Time to turn on my vacuum. Time to go, and then and then I'm going to move back home, um, whatever, right? I, I'm, I'm going to get my, I, I, I found what I was looking for. I'm going to go do my work. I'm going to go put it on a conveyor, whatever. Life is good. But if we're searching and searching and searching, and we actually achieve position three because the skip never happened to shove us over to eight, the little leapfroggy thing, if, if that never happened, well, then we're, we're going to tell it, this is almost like an if else. I'm going to, in fact, I'm even going to say that. Let's make that pretty. Let's make a really nice, nice code. Always got to be good with this kind of stuff, guys. Say, if no 
touch jump to label 9. So let's clean this up a little bit. I don't need that big of a gap there. So I need to, if no touch happened, let's go to label 9, which label 9 can be way down here at the end of my code. Label 9, whoa, label 9, nothing found. Maybe at this point, this is where you do something like you turn on a, uh, a fault light or, a, or an alarm. Actually, we, we could even call um, a user alarm, call a user alarm that you build that says, hey, I'm out of parts, whatever. This is the nothing found result. And if you want, you could also have it move to a, a safe space or move, move to home. Uh, or whatever, uh, have it move home. Now, this this gets a little sketch. Let me go like this so you can read a little bit better. If you look at my program here and look at the program flow, how it flows, let's read this together. It comes through here. We start at home, go above the part, start looking for parts, Let's assume we found the part. Okay, we found the part, so we're going to go to label 8. Well, if we're going to label 8, we're skipping these guys. So we're leapfrogging that. That'll never happen. We'll go down here to 8, boop, and we're going to start doing work. Well, if we're doing work and then life is good, you want to make sure that you don't just keep on going and call alarms and stuff, right? Like, if you're doing work, you better have it go back up to, like, a label one and start back over, do some more leapfroggy stuff. Let's do, like, a jump to label one, and maybe label one is way up here at the beginning of your code. Label one program start, and then the robot just keeps searching, and it just repeats. Go back home, search for a box. Hey, a touch occurred, so we go to label eight, we place the box on a conveyor, jump back to label one. Now we've got a little infinite loop here that's going to keep picking and placing boxes until you don't find a box, which is where label nine comes in and actually breaks you out of the loop. This jump label nine leapfrogs you down to there where there's an alarm or a go home or whatever. Um, you could also even have it set up that um, if you only wanted to find one part and you don't want an infinite loop, you could have a jump to label 99, go insert, and then go down here and say label 99, and that's literally just the end of your program. So in this situation, we searched, we found a part, so we went to 8. We picked the part and went home, and once we went home, we just jumped to label 99, which means we skipped all the alarms, and then, hey, now you go, your, the main routine is done, you call another program, whatever. You can see how this gets leapfroggy. You hear me saying leapfrog, it's boing, 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 they're all jumping around. Do you jump back to the top? Do you jump to an error? Do you jump to work? Do you jump to an end? It's all these skipping arounds. But once you get the, the flow, and if you comment your code really well, um, it, it's actually not so bad. I might have even made it worse with my rambling. But that is the actual flow uh, of, the, of the program. So I think I've rambled enough, guys. That, that's probably enough. Don't let me beat a dead horse. Um, this is a lot to absorb. I really hope that this, this helps. I, I would love for you guys to, to try it, play with it, drop some notes in the comments that help the other users. Um, this is a really powerful tool for, for a low dollar amount. Bring some intelligence into your, uh, uh, into your yellow robots. And uh, guys, just, just keep, keep the love coming. And as always, have fun coding. See ya.